Hi, Restored Church. This is Tom. I am recording this video uh, from my house with my iPhone and my little AirPods here so that you can hear what I'm saying. Uh, here's, here's what I want to do. Um, first off, I just want to tell you uh, I hate that I have to do this. Um, I hate that I have to use a camera and AirPods right now. I wish I could see you in person. I wish I could be with you. Um, I genuinely miss you. I speak for Ebony and the girls when we say like a part of us is genuinely uh, missing not being able to be with you in person. But I'm very thankful and grateful for technology like this because it helps us stay in contact. Um, what we've been doing in this season in regards to responding to the whole COVID-19 and coronavirus thing, and uh, we've, been, we've been rallying around kind of three big um, Three big initiatives for our church, and these are the primary things that we're focusing on this season. Uh, primarily, we're focusing on prayer, on worship, and on service. Crying out to God in prayer, listening to Him in prayer, seeking guidance, seeking wisdom, um, and like I said, crying out to God for His hand to move and for Him to bring His kingdom in, in, in tangible and specific areas. And also, uh, worship, praising Him. It's it's a weapon that we have to guard ourselves. And frankly, to, uh, to advance his kingdom in place of the kingdom of darkness. And also service. Like how do we as the church identify the needs among us, not just within our community, but without our community, outside of our community, I should say, and work together to sacrificially see those needs met, to sacrificially manifest the love of God to each other and to the people around us. So that's the primary things that we're focusing on in this season as a church. Um, prayer, worship, and service. But also pastorally, I, I, I desire for us to have supplemental resources that can, that can aid in our motivation to live lives that follow Jesus, um, that submit to his lordship, that enjoy him, obey him, and operate like him in every single area of our lives. So some of these supplemental resources, what it's going to look like is a lot of us have the rhythm of Sunday morning. So what we're going to do, it, we've got together as a family of churches, um, Uptown San Diego, South Bay San Diego, Restored LA, and also um, Harbor City in South Africa and Durban. We've come together and said, hey, how can we help to resource the church in this time we have this rhythm of Sunday morning. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be offering on our YouTube channel, which you're, if you're watching this, you're already there, offering um, uh, Mark and the team is going to work together to do uh, live streaming of worship, which I think is really, really cool, where we can engage together in worship. And also uh, we're going to post videos of some short kind of messages. And actually this is going to be the first message in a series that we're titling Seek First. And it's, it's all about this idea of how do we follow Jesus through crisis and uncertainty, which if two words come to mind that describe the current climate, it's, it's crisis and uncertainty. But how do we, as, 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 as disciples of Jesus, how do we follow him in times like this when it's not comfortable? That's the kind of conversations that we're gonna ha be having. That's the messages that we're gonna be putting out. So this very first message is gonna be by our dear friend, Grant Clark um, from Durban, South Africa. Uh, Grant leads Harbor City Church. We love Harbor City. They're amazing. They're part of our family of churches. This isn't like a guest speaker that we're just conveniently putting up on a screen for you. Um, no, this is, this is a brother. Uh, this is an ally from the other side of the planet. Um, and I've listened to this message and, I, and I, I'm confident that God's going to use it to bless you um, and to motivate you to continually live a lifestyle of following Jesus. And for us specifically as Restored Temecula, to give ourselves to prayer, to worship, and to service. We really believe that's what God's calling us to. So enjoy this supplemental resource. Enjoy this message. If you haven't already, um, engage with the, the virtual worship in terms of like listening to the crew um, and engage with them and praising God. It really, is, um, it really is a privilege and we really do need it. So hope you enjoy this. Know that I love you dearly and I wish I could be with you. But until then... Godspeed. Good morning, everyone. My name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors or elders at Harbor City Church. And really so much has changed in our world over the last while because of the coronavirus, I guess, including the way that we are meeting as churches over the next while. And as much as all of our lives have been impacted by this and as our churches have been impacted by this, I hope meeting like this in homes and worshiping in this new and different way is life-giving and refreshing for you. 
while we, I guess, appreciate the fact that we've been able to gather in bigger gatherings and bigger venues all together to worship and pray and learn and enjoy Jesus together. And I hope over this time, like a deep longing would actually fill our hearts for the church and for being able to do that together again. But really in light of this unique moment that we're in as a church, as churches and globally, uh, what we've decided is to push pause on the series that we were in and to start a new, I guess, teaching series called Seek First, really just helping us to be the church and to follow Jesus in uncertain times. And I think a really cool thing about that is that we're going to be partnering together as the Restored Family of Churches to build these sermons, to create resources, and to put out some daily devotions to help all of us to follow Jesus and to encourage us in this time. Now, I think for me, uh, starting off this series, I think I've had a number of conversations with people in our church uh, and people in our city, people that I've bumped into just about what life is like for them at the moment, what's going on in their minds, uh, what questions they've got, what they're praying, what, what challenges they're facing. And thinking for myself uh, as a pastor, how to shepherd our church at this time, Psalm 23 just jumped up in my mind. And I think as we go through that this morning, you'll see how relevant it is for all of us at this time. So let me read the first four verses to us. Psalm 23, verse 1 to 4 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm sure for many of us, whatever your background is, uh, that is a familiar passage of scripture to you because that has probably popped up in school assemblies, at funerals you've been in, maybe in movies and TV shows you've watched where there's been a church service involved. I think because of that and the cultural currency that that passage has got in our world, probably for many of us, this seems like a bit of an old fashioned, outdated, overdone passage that's not really relevant to our lives. But What I'm hoping to show you today is really how significant this is for us always, but particularly in a moment of crisis like this. And the passage starts with, uh, I guess, this declaration of what God is like. The Lord is my shepherd. And this is a psalm of confidence in the Lord's care. The writer David, one of the great kings of Israel, a man who's described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, who's walked with God for years and really has seen this track record of God's proven faithfulness and care, is writing to us and comparing God's care for us to the same leadership, care, protection and provision that a shepherd has for their sheep. Now listen, the early church seemed to have loved the picture of God as a shepherd. They love John chapter 10, where Jesus is described as the good shepherd. And they love the parable from Luke 15 of uh, Jesus really as the shepherd going and searching for the lost sheep and bringing them home. So there would be many ancient artifacts depicting Jesus with a sheep around his neck, him carrying that lost sheep home. And I guess for all of us today, I want to ask you, do you need care this morning? Do you need care? I think some of us at the moment are carrying burdens on our own, which are feeling very heavy. And God might be saying to you this morning, let me carry that burden for you. I think probably for some of us, uh, we haven't shared the burdens that we're facing. Maybe the sin, the fear, the uncertainty, the concern that is going on in our hearts. We haven't shared that with God or with anyone else. We're just trying to tough it out and do it on our own. Maybe for you in the busyness of life, you've actually been distracted from God or you've been distracting yourself from this thing that's going on in your life. Just thinking, if I don't think about it, I don't have to deal with it. And maybe at this time, you've got a bit more time to pray, to come to God, to slow down, to stop letting those distractions stop you from dealing with this thing and that you could bring this burden to God and pray and ask him to help you with it. Would you let God care for you this morning? Secondly, I wanted to ask if you are lost at all. You know, if you realize at this time how far maybe you've wandered from God, you've wandered away from where you used to be, you've wandered away from where Jesus has been leading you. And for some of you this morning, this could be a time to begin to start a relationship with the Good Shepherd. Maybe today you need Jesus to forgive you. Maybe you need Jesus to lead you or care for you. Maybe you've never known the Good Shepherd before. Today you could start that journey with him. Or for those of us who've been following Jesus for a longer period of time, maybe we realize how lost parts of our lives are. 
Maybe there are parts of our hearts, of our minds, of our decision making, of who we are, that we've allowed to drift further and further away from God. And maybe at this time, the shepherd is calling those things back to himself and wanting to bring those home. Will you let the Lord shepherd you today? After this declaration of who God is, we get this promise, I shall not want. God is a provider. And he says, I shall not want because he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. Now, listen, I know some of you are quarantined because you have to be. Some of you are self-quarantined. Some of you are just practicing social distancing. But I'm pretty sure none of us have said to a friend, you know what? In the midst of all that's going on with the coronavirus, the one thing I'm craving is just a good green pasture, man. I would kill for someone to lead me beside some still waters. Oh, as soon as this is over, that's what I'm going to do. No, those are sheep things. That's not the stuff we want. When we want something, we're experiencing a lack of something that we need. So I want to ask you, what do you need right now? You know, are you spiritually fed? Are you refreshed? Are you rested? Are you fearful? Are you in need in any way? Because the promise here is that he will make me lie down in green pastures. He will lie, lead me beside still waters and restore my soul. And that traditional language of uh, he makes me lie down almost sounds a little bit threatening. It sounds a little bit domineering, like he, like there's some force involved, like the shepherd trips the sheep or puts some kind of WWE stranglehold on the sheep until they kind of submit and go to sleep. That is not what is going on here, just to be clear. But sheep will only lie down and they've had plenty to eat, have quenched their thirst, and know that they are not in any danger, that they're not being threatened by any wild animals or enemies. Add to this, sheep are quite complicated, as you'll see. Sheep are afraid to drink from moving water, even if it is shallow, which means that sheep might hear a water source, they might run to a river, and when they get there, they're not able to drink from it because the water is moving, which seems crazy. So what these ancient Middle Eastern shepherds would do is they would actually dig like a little furrow, a little side uh, dead end channel next to the rivers where the water could flow in and it would be still so that the sheep could get down on their haunches or whatever sheep have got and they could drink that still water and quench their thirst, which kind of blows my mind. We see such a dependence of the sheep on the shepherd in this passage. And here we see that the shepherd can't, the sheep can't even drink without help from the shepherd. I think some of you are probably sitting there going like, Sheesh Grant's got a lot of weird sheep trivia up his sleeve. And yes, I do. Uh, but really that shouldn't blow us away as much as I know it is. What we should be blown away by is the fact that God is like that shepherd who soups down, gets down on his hands and knees, digs that little side channel just so that we're able to drink and be refreshed. The shepherd knows what the sheep need even better than the sheep do. Sheep need grass, sheep need water, sheep need safety so that they can rest and sleep. And the shepherd provides those things and makes sure the sheep have them. And God, our good shepherd, knows what we need even better than we do ourselves. And at this time, I want you to know that he is offering those things to us in himself. Each day, the shepherd has to wake the flock up and take them to a place where they can find food and drink and rest. I want you to think about the monotony of that, doing that every single day. You take the sheep to a new patch of grass and let them eat. And then you take them to the river and you dig that furrow so they can drink. And then you take them to a place that they can lie down and rest. And then you wake up the next day and repeat every single day. Real Groundhog Day experience going on there. Sheep really need a lot of TLC. They're, they're fussy and needy creatures. And it's fine for us to see that in this text and laugh about it. But then when we realize that this is talking about us, that we are fussy and needy, that we go through the same things every single day, that we need the same things from God, uh, we realize just how dependent we are on the shepherd for everything. I hope you also see here that God cares for you. God cares for you so much that he's willing to go through the monotony of walking through the same things with us day in and day out, every single day. He walks us through this normal everyday stuff. But then in moments like this, moments of crisis, uh, extraordinary moments, unusual moments, God walks with us through the ups and downs of life. And in a global pandemic like this, I think one of the things that probably many of us are realizing is just how dependent we are on God for everything that we've got. 
for us as sheep at this time, what we need more than anything else is to be fed by the word, the scriptures, to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. And we need to follow the voice of the shepherd to a place of rest for our souls. The third thing that it speaks about here is the fact that the shepherd leads us. Now, what a good shepherd would do is walk ahead of the flock and they would either play a tune on a pipe or they would sing a song or they would call to the sheep using their voice. And the sheep would follow that voice or that familiar tune. Now, in the ancient Middle East, obviously shepherds would sometimes bump into one another and the their sheep would kind of get a little bit mixed together. And often they would meet at a watering hole or a spring or a well where the sheep were drinking. And what would happen after this weird little sheep powwow or sheep social was going on is that the shepherd who wanted to leave would call their sheep or would play their pipe or would sing that song and the sheep would know their shepherd's voice or tune or that familiar sound and they would kind of disperse. They would um, unmix themselves and follow their shepherd wherever he was leading. And for us at this time, this time of the coronavirus, there are so many songs going on. There are so many voices speaking out. There's so much noise in the air, whether that's social media posts or blogs and resources or news developments or the voice of fear and uncertainty or fake news or whatever it is. And I want to ask you today, whose voice are you responding to? Who are you following? Who are you being led by? And is it Jesus's voice or some other shepherds that you are following? The fourth thing is even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Sheep have got no defenses. Think about other animals and the way they can protect themselves. You know, even just domestic house pets. Cats have got claws and they can move pretty quickly. Dogs have got teeth and they're pretty strong and resilient. But sheep have just got wool and that's not really going to help them against any predators. And that basically means that the sheep's only security is the shepherd. Without the shepherd, the sheep is defenseless. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the rod was the shepherd's primary offensive weapon and they'd use this to protect their flock from enemies, whether that was a thief or a wolf or a bear or whatever it is. And it was kind of this short two and a half feet long uh, weapon with a mace-like end where they'd often put pieces of iron. So look out for shepherds, they were pretty, pretty strong and formidable. But as we read this, one of the things we realize is that God is described like this. God is not a pushover. God is strong and he's armed. He is our defender and he can take care of us and protect us from darkness, from evil and from our enemies and threats. The other thing the shepherd has got is a staff, which is a lighter, longer kind of stick with a crook on the end. And the shepherd would use that to lean on. He'd use that for comfort, but he'd also use that for care. He'd use that to reach out and to guide the sheep as they walked along the path. And if a, a little lamb or a sheep fell off the path, even into a little ditch, the shepherd could pick them up with a crook and put them back where they were meant to be. See, the shepherd's staff is not for defending the flock from any external threats, but for caring for the sheep as he leads and guides them daily in search of food and water and a place of safety and rest. I guess in some ways it feels like Psalm 23 could end there. Now, after those four verses, we've got some application. We could pray into some of those things and have some tea or coffee and be on our way. But there are two verses left in this passage. And the next verse is a bit of a weird verse that feels a little bit out of place to me after what we've just read about the shepherd leading the sheep through this valley of the shadow of death, through the midst of enemies and evil. And I guess some commentators talking about this imagery say that those shadows represent places in the desert where the shepherd couldn't see. He couldn't see if there were enemy, any enemies inside of there or any wild an, uh, animals. They didn't know if they were safe going through that space. Uh, walking past these shadows meant that they were going through, I guess, a time of uncertainty, danger, and the unknown. And into the, the midst of this, verse 5 says, You, God the shepherd king, you prepare a table, this lavish banquet or party for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
Now, we might expect this kind of uh, verse at the end of the dark alley, you know, kind of after you've gotten through the danger and uncertainty and unknown, that's when you pop the champagne, that's when you get your friends around or go to a restaurant and you celebrate that it is done. And I'm sure some of you already are thinking when restaurants are open again, when you can go out, when uh, we're through this uh, crisis moment, what you're going to do to celebrate. But the psalmist writes that God, our all-knowing shepherd, serves us, which is an amazing thought on itself, but he serves us by preparing a celebration banquet for us in the midst of uncertainty and in the presence of our enemies. This is really an amazing thought. God is doing this in the crisis, not afterwards. And Jesus, our good shepherd, is not crazy. You know, you might read this and think, why would you do this, God? He's not out of touch with our needs. He understands our feelings. He knows what you were going through. This isn't irresponsible behavior on God's part at all. In fact, throwing this banquet or party for us is what we need. Remember, Jesus took on flesh. He walked this earth. He experienced the same obstacles and fears and troubles and enemies that, he, that we face. He can relate to whatever you are going through at the moment, what you may be going through down the line, what you've gone through and the things that you will face. So why throw the party in the middle rather than at the end? See, the good shepherd is calling us to trust him and to depend on him, not just when things are simple and easy, but always, even in the midst of great difficulties and opposition. Or as Paul the Apostle writes in Philippians 4, verse 4 to 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. At the time of the global corona pandemic and its many small and big effects on our lives and our world and all of the uncertainty that comes with this, are we able to say, I will fear no evil for you are with me. In Psalm 23, the sheep doesn't deny the dark, shadowy valley or the enemies that they face because they are real dangers and the sheep acknowledges them. But at the same time, the sheep doesn't allow himself to be defined by this valley of the shadow of death, this crisis that he faces. Instead, he does not fear and he does this for good reason. The sheep is not irrational here. What he decides makes a lot of sense. The reason he doesn't fear is because God, his good shepherd, is with him. And he acknowledges that reality in the midst of the crisis. He brings his fears, his uncertainties, the unknown before God. And he believes that God will care for him. Now the psalm ends by saying this in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow or pursue or hunt me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And as we read this, it's like a flip has been switched. And I say that because the sheep situation hasn't changed. They're still going through the valley of the shadow of death. They're still surrounded by danger, unknown uncertainty and enemies. All of that is still going on. But for the sheep, it's like their perspective has changed. They've gone from being focused on the problem and what's going on around them to being focused on the shepherd and dependent on them and trusting in them. And for all of us, as we're affected in different ways at this time, now is the turn, time to turn our eyes onto Jesus, the good shepherd, who says of himself in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd, just like in Psalm 23, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. On the cross, Jesus laid down his life for you and I. You see, Jesus didn't overcome the enemies that he faced. In fact, he allowed himself to be killed so that you and I may go free and live. Uh, on the cross, Jesus didn't pass through the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus was consumed by death and darkness, and he died so that you and I could live, that we could live in the life that is truly life and experience life and life to the full as he promises us now. And that we can know, even as we go through periods of uncertainty and crisis, that God loves us, that he is committed to us, and that his mercy and goodness follow us all the days of our lives, even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. 
You see, Jesus didn't just die in our place, as amazing as the truth as that is, but he also rose from the dead, defeating sin and Satan and death. And he rose in victory so that he is able to say to each of us and encourage us today in John 16, 33, saying, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We don't just serve a shepherd who loves us and who cares for us and has the best intentions for us. We don't just serve a shepherd who has died for our sins, but we serve a shepherd king who has risen victoriously from the grave and how rules and reigns over the entire universe. He rules and reigns over all things, including the coronavirus and including the specific challenges that you are facing at this time. And because of this, we can know that his goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives, and that even now, in the midst of uncertainty and crisis, that we can dwell in the presence of God, in a place of rest and peace, where we are fed and refreshed, and we can find comfort for our souls.